All right, we all recording? Yes, we recording. are. Recording. Looking good. Count it down live one more time. <laughs> Three, two, one, go. 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 Close enough. Amber did not say go. She is off the show. <laughs> uh, we'll never have her back or speak of her. Goodbye, everybody. And that was the last woman they had on the show. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when you have them on. Yeah, what do you... <laughs> Hello, Grey Wolves. It's episode 25, in which we will be discussing Lady Ghostbusters with special guest... Amber Ali Frost. Amber, how's it going? Hey, it's going great. Thank you for having me on. Like I said, we will be uh, breaking down the cultural flashpoint that is Lady Ghostbusters. But before we do that, let's just uh, introduce ourselves in case you forgot. It's me, Will Meneker, with Felix Biederman. Hey, everybody. And Matt Chrisman. Hello. So, like I said, there's there's much to discuss uh, about the about the Lady Ghostbusters movie and all of the uh, controversy surrounding it. Before we get into that, I just was hoping, Matt, that you could give uh, us all just a little preview of our next show's coverage of the Republican National Convention because you were on the ground in Cleveland on Monday uh, doing some boot leather uh, reporting. Can you give us a little uh, little snippet of things to come? Well, I spent most of the day at a park right next to the Cuyahoga River in the flats in Cleveland, probably two miles away from the Quicken Loans Arena, at a Alex Jones-sponsored, quote-unquote, unity rally uh, that was actually called America First. So, you know, boom, right there on the nose. Uh, Milo was there. Alex Jones, of course, headlined everyone's favorite. uh, Black conservative Wayne Dupree was there. Uh, a collection of scam artists and aspiring politicos came on and ranted, and most humorously enough of all, I'm fairly certain that there was at least one reporter for every person who actually attended the thing. Uh, now, I yeah. want to. Uh, we're going to have uh, Brian Quimby on uh, for our next show to uh, to discuss the Republican National Convention. But the one thing I want to ask you about is. Uh, Tucker Carlson uh, ducked his head inside your car, Matt? He did, yes. We it were, looked like we, he was soliciting. Uh, basically. <laughs> uh, we, we, were, we were driving past the, the big hotel complex thing and past this alley that had a bunch of, uh, bunch of election-related gigaws and, and spectacle that we hope to go to tomorrow when we go back. And... We were moving at a very slow pace because it was getting near rush hour, and I saw this douchebag in a suit talking on a cell phone, and I was like, that's Tucker Carlson. And Brian looked, and he was like, yo, my God, that is Tucker Carlson. So we got our phones because we wanted to, you know, we were basically playing Pokemon there. Trying to catch <laughs> I, got a, I got a lot of Pokemon. I got, I got a, uh, a Chris Hayes-Azard. I got uh, Jeb Lundichu. I, I got a lot of... Uh, barely tethered to reality mons. So we get our phones out, and he sees us take our phones out. And he just walks over to the thing, and he goes, what are you guys doing? And Brian says, taking pictures. Uh, uh, And he goes, of what? And he says, of you people. (laughs) (laughs) You And Carlson, yeah, and Carlson, like, bends in, and he's like, oh, you want a picture, huh? And so... uh, so Brian tries to do, you know, a selfie, and he, like, has a little trouble. It takes him a second to get the thing front-facing, and so, of course, Tucker starts negging him. And he's like, how old are you? You don't know what you're doing. Mm. Uh, and then, yeah, he's just being, he was being an alpha frat douche. Uh, and then, yeah, Brian got a photo, and then he split. He was wearing, I was thrown for a bit because he was wearing a regular tie. He wasn't wearing one of his fancy lad bow ties. Oh, so that's really? why for a second I actually didn't think it was him at first. 
I honestly was like, oh, wait a minute, he's got a regular tie on. That's not Tucker Carlson. And then we got close to like, oh, I guess he decided to mix it up. Variety is the spice of life, you know. Also, beating up gay people in bathrooms, also the spice of life. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's my favorite Tucker Carlson thing. Uh, for people that don't know, Tucker Carlson claimed to have assaulted a gay person who came on to him in a bathroom. But if you look at Tucker Carlson, he has... Uh, the inbreeding that only rich people do, and I think if he ever tried to throw a punch in his life, like his fucking shoulder would come out of its socket. His brother's name is Buckley. <laughs> These clearly are people who like butted off of some fungus in a basement, uh, you know, in like Chappaqua or something. They, there's something going back to the names. There's something about when you pass a certain level of wealth. I don't know if it's like fifty million or a hundred million. You start naming your children exactly as you would your dogs. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I mean, yeah, the obvious, the obvious example of that is Gretchen Carlson with her children Yates, Yardley, and Thatcher. Oh, yeah. God. oh That's God! Or, or like Will, like William F. Buckley named his dog Sebby, which could easily be a Carlson brother or cousin. <laughs> we all agreed on Sebby's excellence. <laughs> well, but before we go too, too far down this rabbit hole, let, let, let's refocus on, on the reason that we're all here today, which is to discuss the Lady Ghostbusters. And I think the easiest segue is, Matt, you mentioned you saw Milo at the Alex Jones rally on Monday. I but, did. I mean, he, was being, he was being, as usual, flooded by just ass-kissing incel dorks, and he, had, <laughs> and he was doing his damnedest to appear not to be disgusted by it, all of them. <laughs> Did he do the hover hand on any of them? Well, he would like hold, he would he would he would stand next to them, and it was very he was he was very dutiful. Like somebody would step up to him and he'd be like, "Okay, this is the next one," and he would sort of like hold himself to avoid contact. He it was very not touchy at all. He tried mm. to keep a, keep a distance, which I understand. I mean, those guys all had like at least a quarter inch layer of grease on them. Yeah, no, but uh, this is the thing though. Uh, Lady Ghostbusters is the is the film that finally got Milo uh, permanently banned from Twitter. I mean, this movie's been out, like... I feel like, okay, so, th- like, as soon as this movie was announced, I feel like th- there's been this um, bullshit uh, controversy about it that, you know, I think we mostly regard as a marketing ploy from the Sony PR department. But, like all bullshit, it has to be based in some small amount of truth, which is this kind of, I don't know, nerd backlash against remaking the, you know, classic uh, Ghostbusters with an all-female cast. And this is the thing that just this week, um, one of the, the lead actresses in Lady Ghostbusters, Leslie Jones, was the target of one of Milo's uh, little uh, attention-grabbing stunts and was received a avalanche of, you know, nasty uh, Twitter harassment and abuse, mostly of a uh, racist and uh, sexist variety, and the outcry over that was such that Twitter finally uh, dropped the hammer on Milo and took away his entire account, not just his uh, check mark. So, uh... R.I.P. He's he's with Harambe in heaven now. But you're talking about how the how much of the Ghostbusters controversy was ginned up as a publicity stunt and it totally was but it's just so interesting to see how both sides in this thing need each other it's a kind of it's a kind of reactionary feminism we don't really have anything to um, sort of throw ourselves behind right now so we get stuck on these sort of cultural representation campaigns that are you know virtually meaningless to nearly everyone in the world um but you know we treat them like they're like this life or death situation and it's insane and, it's and, completely and, and, insane and, and, and it's and it's made up but at the same time there are guys like milo who also for their own relevancy to continue need these things to happen so they could be on the other side of it yeah there was the uh there was a buzzfeed listicle uh that i was showing a will yesterday it was a 12 12 ways yeah. you can support the the Lady Ghostbusters. They didn't call it Lady Ghostbusters. That's just what it's called in my head <laughs> for the now. Purposes, no, for the purposes of our show, the, the film is called, the title of the movie is Lady Ghostbusters. So yeah, yeah. I think we've all decided that. Yeah, yeah. no, I actually, I, I, I have this uh, article up in front of me right now, and I think this is a good um, uh, gateway into our discussion. Uh, 
This is by Alana Bennett. She's a BuzzFeed staff writer, and the title of it is 12 Ways You Can Support the New Ghostbusters Movie Against the Hate Campaign. And now, Amber, you looked into this, and this is not a sponsored post. This, is one of the, this isn't one of their native uh, yeah, advertising things I kept, on BuzzFeed. I kept looking for the little sponsored post thing. It's not that. It's amazing. These people, these women are working for free for like this, you know, multi For the Sony dollar. PR department. Yeah, it's insane. And, and eventually the, avi- the advice just kind of adds up to, you know, go see the movie and, you know, talk about how good it is online. You know, like basically like form an organic street team for this Hollywood summer blockbuster. I, I hear the I hear the feminist Ghostbuster partisans are sending people in with suicide vests to the Jason Bourne movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ghostbuster Ghostbuster fans swim like fish yeah, through the it, sea of the peasantry. It's insane. <laughs> it was the it, and it became this thing before the movie, and and this was way before the movie came out too. Where it was like, you know, it, it's, it was equivocated with activism or organizing in some way. It was like you go see the Lady Ghostbuster movies as like a, you know, equivalent to sitting at a lunch counter in segregated Mississippi. It, it, it's completely insane. And people people have bought into it. And it's, and it's become this weird back and forth between like five basement troll guys and like this roaring online feminism reacting to the basement trolls. Wait, wait, well, I I mean, I haven't seen this movie, but are you guys saying that uh, a bunch of cynical liberals use consumptionist politics because they can't face any inconvenience that causes them to live their lives any difference, and they internalize all their consumer choices as actions because they don't have any beliefs? Uh, <laughs> I'm Hamilton! <laughs> Well, uh, of the 12 ways that you can support uh, Ghostbusters, uh, probably half of them involve just um, giving your money to the Ghostbusters franchise. Give your Um, money to Lady Ghostbusters. And the other half involves spending your time uh, marketing uh, Ghostbusters. For free. Yeah, let's go through a couple of them. Uh, The number one way you can support Lady Ghostbusters is go see the damn movie. So yeah, buy a ticket. My favorite is number two. Go see it multiple times if you have the means. I like that they have the caveat if you have the means, you know, because they don't want to be like they don't you know, goading you. people. Yeah, they don't want to be goading people of like you know low income and just seeing go- Ghostbusters multiple times. I had uh, to. Uh, I had to move out of my apartment into my car, but it was worth it because I saw Ghostbusters fifteen times. You're a freedom fighter. Yeah. Number three is uh, bring your friends, get other people to spend money on the movie. Uh, number four is make the theater as rowdy and supportive as a bunch of drunk girls in a bar bathroom, a.k.a. the pinnacle of supportive fun times. Yeah, that's yeah, right. That's what everyone <laughs> wants in a movie, a fucking bachelorette party. Yeah. yeah. I, number I, I four did, I, is specifically I, I, uh, designed to make uh, Rod Dreher's friend N-Word uh, go insane. <laughs> I Look, I... These guys are being snarky. I haven't seen the movie yet, but when I see the movie, ladies, I want you to feel safe. Take your shoes off. (laughs) Wear open-toed shoes. Just put those doggies in the air. Just come on. Completely barefoot, ladies. Let's have fun. Let's make this supportive. (laughs) Another one of my favorites is uh, number seven. Make a hashtag to counteract the hatred. And they Mm -hmm. recommend a few. Uh, Like, go see Ghostbusters. Support Ghostbusters. And then, or something salty and misandrous like ball busters? Question mark. That'll show ooh, them. Ooh, how, about, how about this? How about this, uh, guys? Guys, check it out. All ghosts matter. Ooh. <laughs> 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 Uh, this this is actually good. Number eight is remind people that Donald Trump also publicly maligned the women-led Ghostbusters. And this is really good because I had never seen this. It's a real Donald Trump Instagram video, and he's sitting in his office, and he goes... They're remaking Indiana Jones without Harrison Ford. You can't do that. And now they're making Ghostbusters with only women. What's going on? This is tailor-made for us, guys. You ready for this? Number 11 is... Give I'm, <laughs> again caveat. I'm not making this up. Number eleven is give in to the pressures of capitalism and buy the shit out of the merch and tie-in food stuff. Hell yeah! <laughs> <laughs> who are these By adult the- women who are like, you know what? I need some uh, ghost busting merch. I want that ecto cooler <laughs> juice box. 
You know, I ate I ate the I ate the slime filled uh, Ghostbusters Twinkies until I got type two diabetes. But I feel like these stumps uh, they're marks of pride. <laughs> when my when my when my wife is going on a date with one of her boyfriends, yes, more Polly <laughs> Polly make your jokes. I am using my special made Ghostbusters Kristen Wig model with flashlight. <laughs> to support the movie, to support myself, and so if you don't like that, you can go take a hike. Well, I feel they missed the beat with this, like you know, plug for the high C uh, ecto cooler juice box, you know, because this is this is you know aimed at you know an, an adult uh, market, but they should have been like they should have been like make a make a Ghostbusters cocktail, sneak in uh, you know uh, hotel sized bottles of vodka into the theater, and do a little mixer with the ecto cooler high C. Get drunk, oh. get rowdy with your lady oh, friends, adulting yeah. like a boss. <laughs> and then finally, number 12, lay waste to their childhood with joy. Dance through all the male tears. Yes. That's what oh, I like the God. most. That's what I like the most, by the way, about Operation Cast Lead. Laying waste to all those childhoods. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite thing about this, about, about the oppositional thing, is that uh, at least on a few websites, they've decided to call these phantom... Mm-hmm. Haters, I, I, they exist, but as usual online, it's fifteen dorks. Sure. And they're calling them ghost bros. Oh, <laughs> come on. You. Which well, to but me, also that's just, that makes it's it too seem perfect. like. Like ghosts well, aren't real, so right. they're kind of. I mean, yeah, that's well, they're giving yeah, they're giving away the game. It's like maybe you're admitting that this is all an oppositional fantasy you've created to ratify your own selfish preferences. No, the BuzzFeed one was pretty peak, but there was actually another one that I liked even better from the all, and I can't even remember what it was called, but it was when Bernie uh, was still pretty pretty viable as, as a potential, you know, whatever. As viable as he ever was, anyway. And uh, it was a satirical piece, and like the conceit of it was like, oh, I'm I'm the guy who, uh, it's not because they're lady Ghostbusters, uh, it's because I have issues with cinema funding or, or, or something like that. And his argument was that, you know, the ghost bros were the same guys as the Bernie bros, and they were trying to argue that there are no legitimate objections you could have to this movie or to Hillary Clinton uh, without, you know, actually having like a sexist subtext to it. Which was like weird because I liked the I liked the metaphor from the other side. It was like I was I was totally on his side. I'm like, yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree with you. I do think we are favoring representation over substance here. Okay. You're arriving at different conclusions than I am. And also you work for the all, which as far as I know still doesn't pay its writers, so that says something about you. It was a, of course a, a male feminist. All male feminist. The most powerful kind. Oh like my god. <laughs> did, to be well, fair to be fair, Bernie did come out against that was actually like when he announced his candidacy, he announced that he was against the female Ghostbusters. Yeah. He, he got up on stage and he was like, You can't hunt a ghost if you're bleeding from your vagina. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> well, I, I think like, we've already... We've that already, was a low moment in his campaign. Yeah. Not a good look. Well, I think we've already proved that it, in fact, is impossible to critique Lady Ghostbusters without being sexist, but I think we should discuss uh, the film itself now. Uh, oh, totally. Yeah, because it, it's worth... Uh, we, we need to do an analysis of, of the text itself. Um, I have seen the movie. Amber right. has seen the movie. Well, and I saw it together. I have seen the movie. <laughs> mm-hmm. Felix has I actually, not seen the I movie. I have to admit that I fought, I fought for my gender here. I did not pay to see Lady Ghostbusters. I paid to see <laughs> The Shallows with Blake Lively, and then I went in and saw Ghostbusters instead. Well, first I watched the last half of Independence Day. Then I snuck in to see Ghostbusters. Whoa! So, oh, you're I did a not. Rogue. I did not oh, give my are. money to those women. I didn't you're do confessing it. Confessing to federal crimes on our show, Matt. <laughs> well, you gave your money I, to Blake Matt, Lively. Matt, I, I'd be curious to know uh, your uh, assessment of the film. It was not that good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was. It was a pretty. It was a pretty generic, obvious attempt to create a franchise 
It's not a good movie, you guys. It's, it's not just not a good movie. And the yeah. funny thing is, is that its badness is very banal. It has not bad because there's women in it. It's not. It's not spectacularly it's bad. No, I think that it. I honestly think I figured out why it doesn't work at a fundamental level, and it's pretty basic. This movie is directed by Paul Feig, right? And he has made some actually good female-centered <laughs> comedies like uh, sure. Bridesmaids and Spy, which I like a lot. And he butted off of the sort of master host body of Judd Apatow, who has also made some movies that I have enjoyed a great deal. And the thing, all of their two movies, all those two guys, all the movies that they've made that I've enjoyed have one thing in common. They have R ratings, because for both of them, their comedic wheelhouse is getting funny people in a room and having them do dirty improv, and then editing the best jokes together and putting them in the movie. They couldn't do swears, so they basically had nothing. Because yeah. they had no other, they had no other mechanism. They have nothing else in their arsenal to do humor with, and they're not visual filmmakers. They don't have any ability to do jokes with like cameras and, and physical comedy. Since they couldn't do swears and they couldn't do dirty jokes, they they were like, "What are we doing here?" And they had no sure. actual comedy in it. Sure, there um, was one a... joke in the movie about queefing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, it it was it was they didn't use the word queef. It was nothing anyone no. would have to explain to anyone. Uh, yeah, no. no, I think, like, the height of the sort of, like, or, well, the nadir of the sort of comedy that it is, I noticed they had a uh, an aborted say hello to my little friend joke in there. And I was just like, oh, we're still doing that. You're still throwing that in there. What? That's funny. As I said funny. To, like, as what, I said if, to, what if one of the ghosts was like, here's Johnny? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's funny. It's good. Well, As but, I said to Amber after the movie, they should have swapped that line out for after um, one of them blasts a ghost, uh, she should say, you are the weakest link. Goodbye. Dude, that's good. Yeah, that's keep good. it topical. <laughs> that's good. Um, but what, if, what, if, what if there was a George Bush ghost and he was like eating banana and was like, ooh, I want oil. <laughs> <laughs> whoa, whoa. Yeah, yeah no, I, I do agree uh, with Matt here. Uh, there's a good... Uh, review of it in Jacobin right now that just went out today. I'm very lucky to have read it by Eileen Jones. And it's called Fake Controversy, Terrible Comedy. And she actually touches on an interview that Paul Feig did where, and I, I'm just going to read from it very, very briefly. Um, we test the shit out of these movies for months, going, is this funny? At the beginning of the movie, one of the first jokes was something Zach Woods ad-libbed about how this rich person's mansion is one of the earliest, most well-equipped mansions in the country. It included a face bidet and an anti-Irish security f system fence. I was like, are people going to be offended by that? You know, like the Irish lobby, I guess, but no. We were slaves! Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. Peter but Peter King the, is uh, yeah. picking it Look in, the Irish were slaves too. Uh, he said, huge laugh every time, but I kept it out for a long time. I was worried people would be offended. We tested it and got giant laughs. We tested again, same thing. Here is someone bragging about testing all of their jokes before putting together something. Here is someone like just, you know, incredibly invested in uh, in focus groups. And and this movie was created via focus group. And that's how movies are made now. And it's not it doesn't have anything to do with it being like, you know, a lady movie. Uh, there's a there's a really good article that like it was written like two years ago that really should have gotten more traction. It's in Flavor Wire. It's called How the Death of Mid-Budget Cinema Left a Generation of Iconic Filmmakers, MIA. And you look at it, they just pour so much money into these incredibly expensive movies. And then they're like, well, this better make money. So we're going to we're gonna create this like mythical audience member, this, this amalgam of all these different focus groups. And we're just going to sell this comedy to that guy who isn't a real person. And... And, and we're going to make all our money back. And, and that same risk aversion is the reason that instead of getting an original female-centered uh, uh, comedy, we got to exactly. fucking remake of Ghostbusters. Exactly. Because it's that's why IP we didn't get a people new, recognize. Yeah, that's why we didn't get a new movie. And Will, what did we see? What were the previews we were looking at? Yeah, like, this is 
And, uh, it's, to me, if you discuss a movie, you have to discuss the entire movie theater experience, and part of that is the previews. Amber and I saw a run of previews that were looked like the, honestly, the worst tripe imaginable. The best of the lot was a movie about a small British boy who conjures a monster to help him destroy things because he's angry that his mom is dead. And I think the monster is voiced by Liam Neeson. That was the best trailer we saw. But it was based off of a already proven, best-selling young adult fiction, I think, uh, series or or book, I believe. We Uh, saw some... uh, They all were. The Tim Burton movie that's based on another YA novel that's just like the Tim Burton X-Men. By the way, Tim Burton, stop making movies for Stop it. You ran out. You're out of juice. You ran... I mean, he, and the thing is, he's been out for a really long time. Yeah, so and at he's this still point, doing it's it. Brutal. Yeah. The only, the only one we saw that could possibly be tagged as original was the Clint Eastwood directed Tom Hanks starring uh, Sully, the pilot movie. But that's just based on a real life. Based event. on a real thing. No one's really making movies right now. But I mean, this is this is totally a question of political economy. Uh, like I looked this up. The budget for Lady Ghostbusters was 144 million dollars. So far, it's made back. 69 million. I'm sure it will <laughs> nice. make yeah, nice. <laughs> I'm sure it will make at least 420 million. Um, <laughs> but Fingers crossed 1488 million. The 1984 original uh, was made for 30 million and factoring for inflation, that's uh, still under 70 million dollars like today. I mean, it's still a big budget movie, but a big budget movie then was it, it was half less than half the budget of this of this movie even the sequel which had a guaranteed return was like 37 million which is like something around like like 86 million by today's it still was nowhere near 144 million they pour so much money into these movies that they that they just like defang them completely until they're just completely boring and insipid and this, Wait, it, it's not a pleasant experience to watch. Wait, Amber, you said they spent $144 million on the new Ghostbusters? Yes. Okay, um, in the words of uh, Sadie Doyle, friend of the show, in her <laughs> article friend of that us was all. released today yeah. uh, titled, Ghostbusters is a classic summer escape film, but from misogyny... Sadie oh Doyle, descri- <laughs> Sadie Doyle right. describes it as a fun little movie. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a mom and pop. It's like, million movie, dollar movie. Yeah, it was another hundred million dollars in, in I bought my tickets at costs. Etsy. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's like how the F-35 is like a cute little airplane. <laughs> <laughs> she describes it as a tiny, imperfect, warm-hearted slice of joy. A diversion, a way to slip into an air conditioner theater during a brutal and depressing summer and feel, for a few hours anyway, something easy and fun exists in the world. Yeah, Just that's the, definitely what we all want out of a movie experience. Air conditioning. Yeah. <laughs> movie with air conditioning, because like, they, they said it goes in the, in the Simpsons. Movie with air conditioning. Yeah. <laughs> also, that really isn't what they were selling before it came out. Before they came out, they were saying it was a revolutionary blow against misogyny. Yeah. I mean, and it, now, it is oh, a mammoth movie. a fun movie. way to hang out in the movie theater. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 the, and the campaign for it was massive and everything. And, the, you know... I think the, the bummer about it is that the cast was super good. Like, all of those women are incredibly funny. And they were all good. Yeah, I mean, their Absolutely. performances are really good. Even, even uh, like, the whole cast, too. Uh, the, the guy who played the bad guy, Neil Casey, he was great as well. Um, they had really good people. Hemsworth was surprisingly funny. Not, o- not only that. They just put them of, in a bad the, movie. All of the bit parts in this movie were... Uh, you know, um, filled by incredibly funny actors. Totally. Like you, are, you already mentioned Zachary Woods, who, in my opinion, is the funniest character on Silicon Valley. Um, Matt Walsh from Veep is in it. Um, even the guy uh, who plays Richard Spelt on Veep has a cameo in the movie. Everyone other than the original Ghostbusters cameos were Oh, God, uh, those funny. are terrible. Oh the original God, the Ghostbusters cameos so were so bad. But, yo, now, no, 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 no. Will vouch for me on this. I did let out a little gasp of delight when I saw Annie Potts. Like, oh I, yeah, I did kind of lose it. So like the Annie original Potts girl is Janine. She was Janine. She was Janine their secretary. Melnitz, man. 
in the original Ghostbusters. And Amber, you said a good thing. Janine Melnitz no, from my I staff. No, I love Janine. And like, I'm growing up, I was, I was like, part of the reason I am on here is because, uh, you know, I, I am a feminist and I am a serious cultural critic. But also, like, I really love Ghostbusters. It is like my flu movie. Like, you know, when you get sick and you watch the movie you watched as a kid, uh, yeah. like, like Ghostbusters is that is the movie that I pop on and it's imperfect but whatever I am nostalgic for it let me let me put that into understandable terms for the listeners to our show you know how when you guys get sick or you're in a bad mood you watch the ISIS Jordanian pilot video <laughs> <laughs> that's what Amber does with Ghostbusters that's what I do with with both of them but I saw Janine and I actually like legit got excited about Annie Potts who did an amazing job in both movies playing Janine and I'm sure as a kid I wanted to be like a Ghostbuster or whatever and I played Ghostbusters but the secretary character uh, who is the, the you know second like major female character to Sigourney Weaver's Dana Barrett uh, she is the person I identified with because she was just like Lazy, sassy, and horny. Like <laughs> she's all real she wanted hero. to do. All Janine wanted to do. Some people think I'm too intellectual, like, but I, it's a fantastic way to spend your spare time. <laughs> all she wanted to do, all she wanted to do, was just like get paid, talk shit, and get laid. Look cute and hit on Jewish men with advanced degrees. And I don't like <laughs> to throw around the word hero too much, but if there is a feminist hero in the series for me, it, it, it's Janine Melnitz. And if I may inter interject from a male gaze perspective, Janine in Ghostbusters 2, Oh yeah, Adon. with the bob? Oh my god, a Adon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I totally, that actually like solidified something for me when my boyfriend was like, oh yeah, but the, 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 the secretary, or like, yeah, yeah, okay, you get it, we're on the same level here. She's my vibe, you get my vibe, yeah. Milo Yiannopoulos with tens of millions of Twitter followers, uh, they're now using you. Literally, I can't believe this is happening. While this coup against the media happens, Fox News has a coup, taking it over, Drudge has warned everybody that the Supreme Court justice told him now is the time they're coming after free speech. He warned a year ago, it's now happening on this show. And I think this interview is you know, up there in importance because this is the day after you've been banned, lifetime ban, and they say under these UN rules, anybody will be banned on the internet, period, if you've been shown to be hateful, for making fun of the ob abominable uh, Ghostbusters movie, so. But yeah, no, mostly the the, uh, the cameos were quite bad. Oh God, the, no, the, the Bill Murray one wanted me to fucking burn the theater down. It was so they bad. Never, they never really established whether he died or not. Like, yeah, what the hell? <laughs> okay, uh, for, okay, so for people who haven't seen the film, i.e. Felix, uh, Felix hasn't seen the movie, and fe what Felix is doing for the purposes of this show is filling the role that Ernie Hudson did in the original Ghostbusters, where right. he is the uh, he's the figure who's the outsider, who doesn't know about Ghostbusting. Wait, fun fact, but, because I know this trivia, they originally wanted to write Ernie Hudson as another scientist, but decided they needed a layman to explain different things to the audience. All right, so guys, uh, for, for listeners, for uh, you guys... I was not able to see Ghostbusters. I'm not able to go to the movie theater because, well, me and a big group of friends, we had a run-in with a woman named N and her son, and there was a misunderstanding. Asking you guys my questions about the movie because I can't see it. I've also converted to Salafist Islam. I cannot see images. Sorry. Movies are bad. Haram. Oh, haram. Uh, okay. All right. What I want to know first... So, how do they alter the plot to make it, like, you know, Yas, clap back, and side-eye, though? Uh, okay, there was a moment uh, when they tried to, like, cover the origin of, like, their interest in the paranormal, and, um, th which is interesting, because they, they didn't really do that for, for the original series, and they ask Kristen Wiig's character... Like, uh, you know, what happened? Why did you get... How did you get interested in the paranormal? And she's like, oh, I was visited by a ghost, and her parents wouldn't believe her, and they sent her to shrinks. And it was very believe women. It yeah. was totally that. Yeah, you gotta believe that. Also, uh, the villain is basically a basement incel. No, the, like yeah, the, yeah, the movie... 
the villain of the movie is Gamergate. Yeah. And yeah. This is where I think we should get into the, well, they, the, clo- the, the close reading of the film that, that only uh, Chapo can provide for you. Yeah. We can break it down for you because... Okay. You don't have uh, to read that close. I'm sorry. You don't have to it's read a, that. It's a little, a little Yeah, they put that shit right on the surface. <laughs> At one point, they're literally reading YouTube comments. <laughs> and, and someone says something sexist. It's it's pretty heavy handed. Yeah, they, they yeah. read it and it so, says like bitches can't be busting ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> I love that was actually that was actually one of the three or four gags in the movie that I thought landed. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, not here's what I'll say. We established <clears throat> early on that that much of this kind of controversy over the movie was a very clever and cynical uh, marketing ploy to get people to talk about and promote the movie for free. That being said, the um, small cadre of begrieved uh, nerds who are angry at the Lady Ghostbusters um, have a right to be angry because this movie was um, an ideological assault on their very existence. Um, We'll start with the villain of the movie, who, as Matt said, um, is Gamergate. Yeah. He is a... um, just Neil Casey, of, he did a great job. He's a sad, doughy nerd, convinced of his own genius, um, bent on uh, exacting revenge on uh, a world that has shunned him by um, releasing ghosts and helping to bring about the ghost apocalypse. Here's the other thing. The other thing with that character is uh, the other lead in the movie, uh, Chris Hemsworth, in another bit of uh, sort of feminist casting, uh, plays the dumb bimbo who becomes their secretary. And the running joke with him is that he's really good looking and stupid throughout yeah. the entire movie. He, he did cl- a decent job too. The weird thing is about this funny. is that all of these people are pretty good at their job. Yeah. 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 And you know, spoiler alert, you know, towards the end of the movie, the ghost of the bad guy possesses Chris Hemsworth. Yeah, because he like, needs more screen time. He had big yeah, he needs more <laughs> And the jokes from that point on become about you know, he's like, "Oh, I should have worked out more when I was alive." Hey, this is what it likes. This is what it feels like to have upper body strength and be uh, sexually attractive to women. Ooh, you know. So that was just another dig at the type of person who's angry at Ghostbusters. You know, the Milo Yabba Dabba Duopolis fan who's you know yeah. seething o- I mean, over this movie. I mean, far be it for me to find plot holes in a Ghostbusters movie because, like, they've always been full of plot holes. But why did when he was possessed? By, by the bad guy still have an Australian accent that that irked me just a little bit. Well, Amber, when you take control of uh, when you're in a um, ghost state, when you're in the ectoplasm state, you kind of are you already t- down t- under no, but in a way. If you take control of a corporeal body, you are still using their vocal cords and um, Australian um, cranium. You know, <laughs> right, and they actually they oh, actually right. do wait, have wait, support wait, for wait. that because he possesses Hemsworth and Hemsworth is next to a motorcycle and he says I hope this guy knows how to ride a motorcycle right so he does have to access his brain now as uh, Amber has already mentioned uh, the other not so covert line of ideological propaganda in this movie is uh, the subplot that uh, nobody believed uh, Kristen Wiig's character when she was a girl that a uh, ghost was haunting her for about a year um, as a child and as a, and people gaslit her, and that's why she uh, tried to hide her belief. In the beginning of the movie, she is trying to get tenure at Columbia University and is hiding uh, the fact that she once mm-hmm. was a ghost scientist. But the whole, but then she reconnects with her childhood friend Melissa McCarthy, who is a proud ghost girl and ghost scientist. And it's sort of about how Kristen Wiig has to come back to believing in herself. And that in, via you, the audience, needs yep. to believe in her as well. But for me, the, um, the, 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 the scene in the movie that is um, where the, uh, the ideology most um, clearly reveals itself is in sort of the act, sort of pseudo-action movie climax of the movie, where the, uh, the four uh, Ghostbusters sort of have to fight their way through a haunted uh-huh. uh, Times Square. It sucks. Um, that, it's that terrible. Is, <laughs> it's some of the worst directed, it also shittiest, looks so affected Disney's haunted filmmaking mansion. I have ever seen. It looks so bad. How the fuck did Ghostbusters have better special totally, effects this 30 is years the ago? One thing I when they spent half with, as much money uh, uh, with Eileen Jones's Jacobin thing, where she said, "Oh, it you know it echoed the." the 90s neon no the original Ghostbusters very dark very dirty even the special effects not neon-y they look great yeah you remember how 
You remember how gross those like uh, yeah, demon totally. dogs look yeah. like? Man, they scared the shit out of me when I was a kid. I mean, There's just absolutely compare nothing the original. In this movie. Uh, compare the original Slimer oh God, to the, the original Slimer shitty Slimer, so much Slimer that they have in this movie. They both eat hot dogs, and when Slimer eats hot dogs, he pops out of the guy's cart, and they're like gnashing around in his mouth. It's got a yeah. visceral reality to it. This is some, this CGI douchebag eating CGI Terrible. hot dogs. Oh, it just has oh, no wait. corporeality to it at all. It's terrible. Wait, wait. A- another line of ideological assault in this movie. There's right, a lady right. Slimer in this movie as well. Slimer, yeah, Slimer gets to smash. <laughs> wait, sorry. Here's a, sorry. Digression. This is in the entire Ghostbusters universe. Oh, uh, what what was Slimer yeah. before he died? Don't, God, think too, I, don't, I actually, don't think too hard on that's it. That's one know, thing. I that's I, know. I heard a theory online that he was Andrew Breitbart. Ooh, I that, nice! I think there might be something to that. I don't know. Wait, Will, we we, we sidetracked from the from the fight. So, okay, so in the, so the action movie climax of this movie, like I said, is is the the ghost girls have to fight their way through a haunted Times Square, and they uh, they're using their proton accelerators to blast a whole bunch of ghosts, and which doesn't scene, make sense, by the way. Just another digression. They use their proton packs to basically kill, kill the ghosts, ghosts, which is upsetting to, to me. Them. In the you ghost trap science the ghosts. consistency, you trap them. Yes, thank you. You trap them. You don't <laughs> kill them. When the, and the thing is, is that they trapped them earlier in the movie. It's not like they decided to change it for this movie. Where now we're killing the ghosts with the yeah, proton pack. It's they not were even catching them merely scenes earlier, earlier with the movie. Thank you. It dro- it's insane. It's awful. It's madness. Once again. In this sequence, uh, they're, they're fighting a bunch of ghosts now, and and throughout it, the sort of the, there is a giant ghost that is sort of directing all of the other ghosts, and that ghost is a giant, ghoulish Uncle Sam, who is who is the avatar of Amer- of ghost patriarchy and masculinity. <laughs> my God, <laughs> and what he's doing is he is sending wave after wave of smaller ghosts at them, smaller ghosts that include. A pilgrim, uh, an executed convict, uh, a hobo of some kind, revolutionary um, prob- war soldier, uh, probably a nine eleven firefighter. <laughs> um, <laughs> I I ain't getting busted by no lady. Yeah, I have the dust all over me. All of these archetypes of masculinity. All of these- are archetypes you call this ghost pizza? Forget about hey. it. Hey, a, a pirate, a hobo, and so on and so on. These are the the avatars of traditional uh, ghost masculinity that are literally being popped by the lady Ghostbusters as, as they uh, make their way to uh, the the giant building that's haunted. That's also a um, a phallic symbol. Because if that's not enough, what just happened there at the very end of the movie, the the head ghost. Uh, the, the incel Gamergate Gamergate ghost. Gamergate It becomes a giant version of the ghost from the Ghostbusters logo and he's stalking towards them and they're trying to like suck him into this vortex with their proton packs which now or they have this oh, it's stupid I don't, there's something pulling them towards this vortex but he's holding like the sides of buildings so that he can't be pulled in and so to get him to move his ghost arms so that it'll suck him into the vortex they shoot him in the dick <laughs> yep, but, but right in the groin. But clap back, baby. But I mean, let's talk about. Yeah, he's the, he's a giant ghost. I was I was watching uh, for research because I take this very seriously. All of my podcast appearances, I take very seriously. I was very watching uh, one last night with a friend, and it gets to uh, the end, and it's the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man, which is, by the way, genius. It's like they invented a very believable brand, you know, and like a cutesy brand, and then made it menacing and made it like a kaiju monster attacking the city. Yeah, it was fucking It was awesome. great, and it's also kind of hilarious and ironic and weird and, and, and modern. Uh, and my friend who I was like watching this with was like, well, who's the big monster in the new one? And I was like, a ghost? He's like, yeah, I know, but like, what is it? And I'm like, no, it's... It's like a big ghost, like a ghost kind of <laughs> ghost, but but really big. And so, also, it's the exact same premise. Choose the form of your destruction. And Melissa mm-hmm. McCarthy says, like a little cute ghost, and then it just becomes like a big ghost. So they like literally took the original premise from the first movie, but then couldn't think of like another 
interesting thing to do with like your subconscious that you would that you would that you would imagine or whatever. It, it goes further than that. The uh, like I said, the climax. It, it's an inversion of the original Ghostbusters because if you will remember in that when they're on top of the building on Central Park West, the gateway is open and they have to uh, confront. They have to cross streams. You know, once again, uh, like men very their dicks together. Very phallic um, to, to confront uh, Gozer the Gozerian. Now, if you remember in that, Gozer was very butch. She had short, she had a flat top. And I believe yeah, the line She was Gozer supposed says, to be based is, off of uh, Grace Jones. They originally tried to get her for the movie. Before that, they wanted to use Paul Rubens and just make him the architect of the the weird super paranormal building and make him this unassuming Paul Rubens character. But eventually they went with like this weird Eastern European chick who looks like a white Grace Jones. Anyway, trivia for you. <laughs> I did not know that. But Bill Bill Murray says aim for the bitch's flat top, right? So at the end of the, at the end of the original Ghostbusters, um, that's kind you know, of what he said. It was let's show this bitch how we do these things downtown. Aim for the flat top. But I digress. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> who's who's the bitter nerd now? Amber? <laughs> I'm always the bitter nerd. <laughs> but at the end of at least you're not the beer nerd. <laughs> At the end of the original Ghostbusters, uh, patriarchal authority is is reestablished. It is reinstilled over a uh, ghost femininity. Right, and, and sleazy Bill Murray gets the girl, and yeah. And in this movie, uh, you know, and, and over and over again, you know, phallic uh, male authority is cut down by th- four badass women. Mm-hmm. Now, and then, now they could have they could have taken this further. In a number of ways that I, th- I think they blew it. I think they missed an opportunity. And uh, just a couple of things off the top of my head. Um, at the end of the movie, a- as Matt mentioned, the uh, there's a ghost vortex again. I think coded as being very vaginal, you know, mm-hmm. um, that sucks in the big uh, gamer gate ghost. Gamer gate ghost, right before he is sucked into the uh, vagina slash vortex, grabs Melissa McCarthy and like you know brings her down with him. Kristen Wiig sees this, she's like, no, I'm not going to let this happen. She ties a rope around herself and jumps into the vortex to uh, save Melissa McCarthy. Now, I thought in this scene, when they're both sort of, you know, past the veil on the other side, they should have, you know, had some call-outs. Uh, they should have maybe been greeted by the ghosts of uh, Virginia Woolf and Sylvia Plath, <laughs> and they should have been like, it, go, fellow ghost girls, it's better over here now. But for the women of today, don't kill yourself. Yeah. It's better now. <laughs> we worked hard so that you could continue our fight. Okay. Example number two. Uh, we haven't discussed this, but um, Kate McKinnon's character in this movie. Kate McKinnon, Woo! who is a uh, gay woman in real life. Her character in this movie is coded as being uh, gay, but not in any explicit way. Uh, it's It's... Sort of obvious if you know about it, but it's never. But if you're a lady stated. looking for ladies, and you were to see that lady, you'd be like, "I bet that's an amenable lady." Yeah. So they had this this gay character played by a gay actress in this movie, and if they wanted to do that and be you know feminist, but still uh, call out the original and give the you know the fans something to hoot and holler about, they should have remade. You know, my favorite scene in the original Ghostbusters, where Dan Aykroyd gets cross-eyed from a ghost blowjob. Mm-hmm. They should have done that. Kate McKinnon should have gotten head from a lady ghost. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> that would have been a truly revolutionary film, but they just didn't have it in them. <laughs> well, again, they kept it They kept it PG-13. Exactly. And the original Ghostbusters was PG, and Dan Aykroyd got head in that yeah. movie. And they and, still said and women, bitch, and yeah. Yeah. That that is that is sexist. That, the one that's that, the first real example of sexism that we found. My my well, favorite homage to previous Ghostbuster stuff in the movie is not any of the bad cameos. It's the fact that they gave Kate McKinnon the haircut and glasses of Egon from the Ghostbusters cartoon. Yeah, something that so many gay women on my Twitter immediately were like, "Yeah, yeah, I liked that cartoon as a girl." Well, it gave me uh, some things some to feelings. ponder because after I saw, because when I first saw Kate McKinnon in the in her Ghostbusters ensemble and hairstyle, I was like, "Damn!" So that makes me wonder: Did I want to fuck Egon when I was a kid? I think you did. Yeah, almost certainly I, yes. Well, I, I, I okay. don't want to overstate like 
the significance or, or you know, whatever, like the the literary resonance of Ghostbusters. I do think people kind of went and I like legitimately loved this movie as a kid. I watched it obsessively. Um, it's I think it was like the first thing I ordered when I got like my Amazon Prime account. Um, but it's an extremely reactionary movie. I mean, like, oh hell yeah, Harold Ramis's um, sort of like I think fantasy audience. I mean, you think about it. these are guys. They're academics. They get laid off, and then they become these blue collar, you know, guys with who wear jumpsuits and have their names printed on them. And then these, uh, you know, these guy, this guy from the EPA shows up and he's busting their balls. And then go e- even further, and in the sequel, they did their job too well. And now the city no longer needs American <laughs> auto manufacturing. I mean, Ghostbusters. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Amber, Amber, that's my favorite part about, uh, I think, the underrated Ghostbusters 2. Is that when Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters 2, 2 is begins... Good as hell. Uh, when Ghostbusters it's, 2 yeah. begins, all of the Ghostbusters are, like, semi-retired... Uh, working bullshit jobs, sort of feeding off their semi-ghostbusting fame, where it's just like, hey, remember a year ago when we participated in the, uh, we're at the center of the single most profound event in all of human history? But nobody believes in ghosts! It doesn't make any sense! They go to the judge! (laughs) First of all, they ask for a bench trial for some stupid reason. I don't understand why they had a bench trial. Yeah. And... The, the judge makes a big deal about how he doesn't believe in ghosts. Didn't you remember the giant fucking marshmallow man? Yeah. I mean, again, <laughs> in the, middle of Manhattan. the movie is full of, of plot holes and has been consistently. Uh, the only way I explain that away in my head is that there would definitely be ghost truthers, like, after the fact. And there would be, like, a mass denial of what happened. And there would be people who believe inside it was... Inside job. Yeah, inside job. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's a super it's sort of not terrible reactionary movie, but I think Ramis's like ideal audience was like, you know, what we call now the kind of like, you know, union Reagan voter, who you know there, there weren't actually that many of those people anyway. The working class didn't in, in mass vote for Reagan, but like those kind of people. And if you look at like sort of the the working class sentiments of the movie, like, that's the kind of reactionary appeal that it has. And that's what uh, Ramis has always sort of, like, wrote about. Now, t- uh, you never Thomas been out of college. I worked in the private sector. They, they expect, expect results. results. <laughs> <laughs> I was, was going to say, uh, Thomas Frank, actually, uh, in, in The Baffler, one of your uh, home bases, mm-hmm. Amber, I that had a very good essay about this sort of entire genre of 80s comedies, most of them either written by or directed uh, by Harold Ramis, the, how the, the, this whole genre of comedies in the 80s, the slobs versus snobs movie, yeah, uh, Ghostbusters, Caddyshack, Animal House, a lot of them... Platoon. S- <laughs> <laughs> They're all very reactionary. And, and proof, in the, proof positive, uh, I remember reading something from... Jonah Goldberg, where he said Ghostbusters was his favorite comedy because the villain was uh, a big government EPA bureaucrat, yeah. and it was a movie that that valorized the small business entrepreneur. But I don't actually right. think that he's right. that resentful. I actually think Thomas Frank was he tapped into something, but I think he was really off. And this might just be me rationalizing it because I like like the movies. But okay, first of all, they did start out as university professors; they're PhDs. Uh, and Bill Murray's love interest in it, uh, played by Sigourney Weaver, in the first movie, she plays cello for the fucking symphony in New York City, and then she somehow makes that lateral movement to restoring paintings for the Metropolitan (laughs) Museum of Art. You know, that, that familiar career path we all know and love. So like, she has a degree in fanciness. It's <laughs> transitional yeah. all throughout I love all her areas of high in the culture. First movie too. It's just like covered in like pink things, and it's just like super prissy. But yeah, no, I think I think uh, I think Thomas Frank kind of missed the mark a little bit. But the slob versus snob thing that is that is Ramus's uh, hallmark, and I do like it. And I also like, and I've realized this is like consistently sort of like my favorite character theme in like literature or movies is I like movies about failures and frauds and 
Ghostbusters was, you know, about failures and frauds. Like, either they failed or they were, like, Bill Murray completely full of shit. And there was no one... He didn't even believe in it. He was just electrocuting a guy for fun at some point. Like, it, it's a ridiculous uh, concept. They're not particularly likable people. And I kind of wonder if they didn't want to make the women in Lady Ghostbusters too likable. There was no fraud in Lady Ghostbusters. Uh, it's worse than that. Pete Venkman was electrocuting that guy so he could uh, have sex with his girlfriend. But was it insinuated that the girl and him were dating? Uh, yeah. I think you're reading, the, 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 I think you're reading into that. Okay, it's my own projection. It's my own projection. <laughs> Speaking of my own projection, I forgot uh, the, the other thing about the original Ghostbusters. Remember the uh, Rick Moranis character uh, who's yeah. thirsty as hell for Sigourney Weaver? Also, Rick Moranis uh, did, did some did some actual like major stri- script contributions to the original Ghostbusters. He does not get enough credit for being like a really comedically smart guy. Yeah, Rick Moranis. Trying to bring it to room temperature. <laughs> <laughs> He d- definitely the funniest parts of the original Ghostbusters were his character. But it's like the whole purpose of the ghost invasion of that movie is like a giant plot device so that he can finally uh, fuck his hot next door neighbor, yeah, right? Yeah, he gets, he gets on that Sigourney Weaver. Yeah. And then again, He's he like, does another ridiculous nonsensical lateral movement in, in the second movie where he goes from CPA to lawyer. Like, they just don't care about <laughs> consistency. In he has a ju- degree in Jew. <laughs> <laughs> See? Which, which is why eventually Janine gets up on that. She loves the Jewish men. Once again, hero. <laughs> She's a hero. I love her so much. In, in summary, <laughs> I'm going to be a little bit easier on this movie than Matt and Amber. <laughs> I, walked, I walked out of the movie and I wasn't angry. So... I'll give it that. Yeah. Um, I, I would say this movie is a uh, comedy adjacent. Um, <laughs> side eye clapback though. <laughs> there's about, there's about I think four, maybe three or four gags that were good. Yeah. But you know, and Ember, as we mentioned, we saw this uh, sort of on a weekday evening in a theater of like kind of middle aged women and their kids, like the most sympathetic. Middle-aged African American women yeah. and their kids—probably the most sympathetic audience you can get for a comedy. Most of the jokes Kinda just didn't fell land. Flat, yeah, yeah. It just—it it, most of the things that were supposed to be funny, it just kind of. I mean, what was good in the movie was what the talent of the the four leads were able to get out of totally. it. But it just there wasn't enough there. There wasn't enough. Yeah, there. yeah. I mean, I don't want to be too hard on it. I just, as a feminist. And as a writer... As a feminist and the world's biggest Ghostbusters fan. (laughs) Yeah, and the world's biggest (laughs) Ghostbusters fan. And as a writer, I I don't like being pandered to. And movies are bad right now. And I want to see women making movies and in movies and, you know, women sort of, like, led and carried movies. But, like, it's one of those things where how significant is representation if we're being represented in just the worst kind of bullshit bourgeois art. I mean, I really to understand that that is bringing a lot to, like, uh, you know, a, a summer blockbuster or whatever. But, you know, here's the argument. Either you believe representation matters, um, and I tend to think that it matters far less than, than you know, sort of like the, the liberal uh, media thinks it does, or you think it doesn't matter. And if you think it does matter, women should get good movies and good parts and not just have to like reboot like nostalgia uh, you know this nostalgia era that we're in right now not just have to like reboot these things that have been like focused grouped to death so they're like well people will definitely see this and then just like you know plaster it together after like years of testing I, I think women can make just funny movies I think we can all just like start making movies again that aren't comic books or young adult literature, or or you know a reboot of something from our childhood. Counterpoint, a counterpoint, Amber. Quote: I didn't think about anything except that a woman was getting the same big slow mo blowing shit up scene a million guys have gotten, and this scene is awesome. I just love- I've <laughs> always loved that scene. Women are treated as big boundary breaking historic symbol of pro. Oh, sorry, women aren't treated as a big boundary historic breaking symbol of progress and equality in this movie. They're treated like people. It's such I'm Hillaryism. Co- I'm co- I'm co- I'm, it's absolute I'm Hillaryism. Yeah, yeah, that's, Doyle, that's Hillary exploding a, a wedding in Yemen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like, it's a girl's turn, baby. Yeah. Uh, in, Sisters are doing it now. In the interest of equality, I haven't seen the movie. 
I don't know anything about Ghostbusters. I don't really know the movies. I don't really watch movies. I don't really process I- information that you I see through my eyes. You just kind of read the Quran. Yeah, I just kind of read the Quran and I react to things. But it ruled. Bring, <laughs> bring on motherfucking lady Deadpool, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I don't want to be too hard on it again. I think the cast is great. It's just, it's just, it's exactly the kind of movie that gets made now. And so it's not going to be good. Because the movies that get made now are bad. The movies are bad. You don't have to get so invested in them. <laughs> yeah, anyway, everyone should absolutely read uh, that article about the, the death of, of the mid-budget film. I mean, this is totally to a that. question of political economy. We will link to that. We will link to Eileen Jones' review. We will link to uh, Sadie Doyle's review. Yeah. Yeah. That's violence. Don't do that. <laughs> Both sides. Highly Both inappropriate sides. ass. <laughs> yes. Amber, thank you for coming on. And, and, and perhaps, perhaps through this dialogue, this dialogue that might have. Might have.